ready for true happiness, for deep fulfillment, for feeling alive, on purpose, and in control of your life again, it's time to be the bold, brilliant, beautiful woman you were born to be. Welcome to the Purpose Girl Podcast. I'm women's happiness and life purpose expert, Karen Rockhunt, and I'm going to teach you how to live on purpose, feel alive, and be happy in every aspect of life. I'm going to get real about my life and interview women who are living on purpose so that you can finally live yours. Welcome to the show. Hello, 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 my purpose girls. So good to be with you today. So when I was a little girl in fifth grade, I thought I had this amazing group of friends. And I showed up one day to school and all of a sudden, none of them would talk to me. And I couldn't figure out what did I do wrong. And then pretty soon, I saw one of them whisper to another one. You know, she put her little hand over her little mouth. And then they started laughing as they pointed at me. And then I saw two more little girls. And even just retelling the story, it's like I can feel the pain that I still felt then. And throughout the day, as I wondered, what did I do wrong? Why are they mad at me? Totally blaming and shaming myself. I found out that they were telling people that I was a lesbian. And that they started this rumor throughout school. Now, of course, 40 years later, I know that I am bisexual, but I don't think in fifth grade I really understood that or knew what it meant. <laughs> but I was horrified. And... <laughs> I couldn't understand why my friends were doing this to me, what their purpose was, what their goal was. It just felt horrible. And that, I think, is the seed of why I do all this work with women. Because I know so well how it feels to be left out. I know how it feels to be pointed at. I know how it feels to be the one who's excluded. And at some point, I don't know what happened, that the rumor went away and they brought me back into their friend group and... Life went on as normal, but that sticks with me. And it sticks with me that what we really need as women and what our girls need to do is instead of tearing each other down, is to lift each other up. And that is what today's episode of the Purpose Girl Podcast is all about. It is all about how we as women can lift each other up instead of tearing us down. And God, I cannot even tell you how many corporate environments, actually it doesn't even matter. I am constantly asked the question, what do I do about the mean girls at, right? It doesn't matter that you might be in your 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. And that's what we're gonna really dive into today because this is so important. And I have the perfect guest who's gonna talk to us about it. Let me introduce you to Molly Galbraith. Molly is the co-founder of Girls Gone Strong, the world's largest platform providing evidence-based interdisciplinary health, fitness, nutrition, and pregnancy education for women and the health and fitness professionals who work with them, including industry-leading certification programs and coaching. Her debut book is called Strong Women Lift Each Other Up, and it's so good. I've been pouring over it over the last couple of weeks. The Strong Women Lift Each Other Up philosophy is woven throughout the fabric of Girls Gone Strong as she leads her international team of women from the U.S., Canada, U.K., Mexico, India, Australia, from employing and educating to featuring, collaborating with, and investing in women. Girls Gone Strong is dedicated to lifting women up in more than 80 countries around the world. Molly has spoken all over the world at top conferences and prestigious universities like Yale, and she's been featured in publications like Time and People. And if you recognize Molly, she was one of our featured speakers at the Women's Day event. Molly, I'm so happy to be back with you again. Karen, thank you so much for that beautiful introduction. And thank you for sharing that story. I mean, I think that, you know, while the details might be different, almost each of us has a story, a painful story like that of growing up and just feeling that rejection from people that we thought were our friends. So thank you for sharing that and being so vulnerable in your own story. Yeah, thank you for saying thank you to me because it's really what I want to say to thank you to you. I open up page one of your book and you share a nearly identical story. Like you said, some of the details are the same. It wasn't about being a lesbian, but it was that your little friends turned on you. 
And I'm curious, will you share that story with everyone? Because it's so powerful. Yeah, absolutely. So I was on a like a trip in eighth grade rooming with a group of my friends. And somehow a rumor got started that I had worn the same pair of underwear two days in a row. And they all started calling me to wear, but I didn't know it. And so they would say like, hey, Molly, what are you going to wear tomorrow? And I'm like, uh, I don't know, maybe jeans, maybe a dress. And they're like, no, no, what are you going to wear? And they all just start laughing. Mm. And it's that laugh that like you look around and you realize everyone's laughing but you. And you know they're laughing at you. And it's just like that hot blush like spreads across your cheek. You just want the ground to open up and swallow you whole. And you just want to disappear because it is just so painful. And the really difficult part about that was that that ridicule and making fun of happened that whole day. And the next morning I woke up and I was so nervous and anxious and I was bracing myself to be bullied again. And all of a sudden another girl became the target. They started making fun of her for something else. And I would like to say that I jumped in and defended her, but I didn't. Instead, I was so relieved that the spotlight wasn't shining on me that I jumped in and made fun of her too. And it like solidified in my little, you know, 12 year old brain, like, okay, only so many girls can be accepted. And to be one of the ones who are accepted, you have to go along with what everyone else is doing. And you have to step on or step over other girls and women. You have to push them down so that you can be on top. And it was just this like, just this lesson that was kind of cemented in my, in my brain for the next probably 15 years. Um, and you know, yeah, it was just really, really, um, painful and some, but something that cropped up again and again in my life. I so appreciate you sharing the second part of the story because the same thing with me, I would love to say that after my rumor dissipated, (laughs) that I was suddenly the beacon for sisterhood everywhere. Like I am now, but I wasn't. I found myself spreading rumors about the other girls, as you said so eloquently just now and in your book, because it was like, okay, it's off of me. This is how to be safe. This is how to be okay. And then it was only later in life that I realized, wait, I'm, I'm craving like a real connection. I'm craving a real safety with girls, with women, and this is not it. And that's it. I want to take a stand for us loving each other and being welcoming to each other, but I want you to know, Molly, you are not alone. Thank you for being honest about that. I did the same thing. Yeah, we've got deep wounds. And I think Brene Brown calls it hot wiring connection, you know? So like spreading a rumor or gossiping or like disliking the same person is like the quickest way to hot wire connection. So when that's what we're craving so deeply is that connection and belonging, and we don't know how to build it authentically, then we do it in a way that hot wires it by, by kind of coming up with a common enemy. Yeah. And then you went on to really get into fitness and competition. So it's like that stayed with you for a really long time. Oh yeah. So I went through all the books. So the book is, is um, it's a, it's not a book that you read. It's a book that you do, but it's part kind of memoir, um, a lot of personal development. So I'm a coach. I've been a coach for 17 years. I'm in health and fitness, but I consider myself to be a coach who helps women get from where they are now to where they want to be. A lot of my work is rooted in behavior change psychology. So I teach women how to actually do the thing that they want to do, right? Like we know we should eat more vegetables. We know we should drink more water, but like, how do we actually do it? Same thing with this book. So it's part memoir, a lot of personal development, walking women through how to become the woman that they want to be first so that they can lift other women up. So the first half of the book is all about getting right with yourself. And the second half of the book is all about how to lift other women up. But throughout that, I share kind of my journey. I got into fitness at 19. I had tried out for the cheerleading squad multiple times in middle school, never made it. Finally made it my freshman year. Um, I'd kind of been teased and bullied again in middle school, as I said. And then I show up first day of ninth grade. And um, all of a sudden, I made the cheerleading squad. And my breasts developed practically overnight. And I was started highlighting my hair. And all of a sudden, I was kind of accepted in the in crowd. Um, it was like blonde you hair were check. You cool. You were beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> big boobs check. Cheerleader check. Like, you made it. You know, like, you've, you've checked these boxes. And so then that solidified for me that, oh, okay. So now the way that I look is more important than who I am. Okay. 
okay, now that lesson, got that lesson, you know, like, Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. man, so that was a huge focus of my life for the next again, probably 10 or 15 years. So um, did that and got into college or uh, joined a sorority in college, then got into fitness in college when I was like a junior and lost a lot of weight and, you know, got in shape to where I went from like a sedentary college student to like, looked like I was, you know, on the cover of a fitness magazine. So then I was getting all this attention and affirmation for the way that my body looked and started doing competitions, figure competitions where you stand on stage in a little bikini and have your body measured next to other women. So literally, so when I, when I joined the sorority, it's like I was numerically ranked and cut if I didn't measure up in the sorority saying, you know, then figure competitions, standing next to another woman on stage, numerically ranked and cut if you don't measure up. So that was a theme that kept showing up in my life was like, you are competing with these other women. They're your competition. You should compare yourself to them. You know, if they have it better than you, it means you're less than. If one woman has success, there's less left for you. So it's just this theme that kept showing up in my life. And then, um, and I had, again, a lot of my own personal struggles with body image and feeling like I was worthy. And I'm, I'm happy to share the story of, of how I hit rock bottom. But in 2013, I hit kind of my personal rock bottom. I was like, you know what? I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm not going to compare myself. I'm not going to compete with other women. I want to like me for me, regardless of how my body looks. And so that kickstart a really powerful kind of personal development journey to where I am now of, of wanting to be a strong woman who lifts other women up, but really getting right with myself first. That is so important. You know, it's so interesting. Pretty much every woman I know has been through a very similar journey, even though most women I know have not been in fitness or bathing suit competitions or anything like that. But it's as if every day is the runway of competition where we've learned, oh, she has blonde hair. She must be better. Oh, she weighs 10 pounds less than me, she must be better. Oh, I weigh 10 pounds less than that one. Or I have a boyfriend and she does. I mean, whatever it is, this constant comparison, because it's constantly like, oh, there's only one girl that can be ahead, or it's about being better than. And it comes down to, as you and I were saying earlier, I think our base human need is to be loved, to belong. And if we've learned that the only way to be loved and to belong is to be better than the other girls, the other women, then of course, I mean, with tons of self-compassion, we continue on that trajectory. Mm. You just happen to do it in like the most public way, right? And and my sorority wasn't like this. I don't know about yours, Molly, but um, I was really involved with like Panhellenic, which is the overarching organization for sorority life when I was in college. And there were a couple of sororities that actually stood the girls next to each other and measured their fat, I mean, the kind of thing, right? Like you were choosing to be in these competitions, but this is the stuff that goes on. Not all sororities, and I hope that that practice is totally done with even the couple that did it. The issue isn't those sororities. The issue is the underlying belief that we're in competition. Yeah, and I think it makes sense. You know, a lot of people say, well, why does this happen? Well, if we look around and we see that 7% of Fortune 500 CEOs are women, We see that only 27% of U.S. Congress is made up of women, and that number is up dramatically in the last couple of years. It used to be around 19%, I think, five or six years ago. We see that only 11% of heads of state globally are women. We know that only 2.3% of venture capital funding goes to companies founded wholly by women. We go to events and panels, and we see there's one to two women out of 10 you know, we, in college, maybe one or two of our professors are women, right? So we see, we look around, we say, okay, so there's only a couple spots for women. Mm -hmm. And then we see who's getting those spots. So there's an exercise that I share in my book from a woman named Dr. Larissa Mercado Lopez. She's a professor of women's studies, gender and sexuality at uh, Fresno State. And she says, okay, Google Well, she originally said Google fit woman, but you can use it with a lot of different adjectives. Google healthy woman, Google successful woman. If you Google the term successful woman and you look at the 50 top images who pop up, those women are young. Those women are white. Those women are thin. Those women are cisgender, which means that the gender they identify with, it matches the sex they were assigned at birth. They are wearing nice clothing. So they look like they have access to finances and resources. So So basically, young, white, 
thin, cisgender, you know, office, heterosexual presenting, what, you know, whatever it seems if they're in a thing with a man or relationship with a man, like they, they check all of these like very normative boxes, right? Okay. So what happens if you're in a larger body? Okay, what happens if you're in a larger body and you're not white? What happens if you're in a larger body and you're not white and you're trans? Like you, you see, as you, you step farther and farther outside of this, like we have this very narrow definition of who gets these opportunities. And so we think there's fewer opportunities for women. And then we look around and see who's more likely to get those opportunities. And then we're fighting instead of working together to create more opportunity for ourselves and each other, we're duking it out for the limited spots that are available. Yeah. And it's, it's subconscious. I don't even think it's like a conscious thing that we realize, oh, we are only seeing one spot, but that exercise. And I have to say, everyone, you need to go get this book because it's chock full of exercises. Like every, I don't know if it's every other page, but every few pages are pages of exercises for you to really go and, you know, as I like to say, go do the damn thing, right? And it's like really get that clarity on who you are and work through the desires that you have and what your own superpowers are. And and as Molly says, get right with yourself. In doing the exercise with successful women, I've also done the exercise with beautiful women. Mm. And it's the same thing. And thinking about all of you women who are beautiful women of color out there, all of you women who have voluptuous, beautiful, curvy bodies who are in your 40s, 50s, 60s, right? But we define beautiful by the same standard as well. You know, and I often think, Molly, from the time we are little girls, so many of the commercials we're seeing, the advertisements we're seeing in teen magazine are basically saying you need this product to be more liked, right? Like you need to dye your hair in order to look more youthful and to be more beautiful. You need this eye cream because your age is wrong or you need this, you know, outfit to be cool and to fit in. And yeah, men's magazines have something similar, but it seems it's like it's more distinguished if they have gray hair. It's more distinguished if, and it's more okay if they've got a little weight on them. It's like a totally different ball game. Well, and if you think about it, what they're encouraging men to do is to be bigger, stronger, faster, and more powerful. And they're encouraging women to be smaller, thinner, leaner, quieter, more palatable, and to shrink. And so certainly men are also held to a standard that is unrealistic and unhealthy for them. And even, you know, the kind of toxic masculinity ways that they're expected to not show emotions and stuff are challenging. And I don't want to take that away. And they are expected to, like I said, bigger, faster, stronger, more powerful, more aggressive, more successful. And bigger and take up more space. Mm-hmm. Right. I, I had Kasha Urbaniak on my podcast. I don't know if you know who she is. She's about all about power. And she has both been a dominatrix and she has been a Buddhist monk. And just bringing, she's like incredible. Yeah, you want to read her book too. And she and I were talking about that where this comes from for women also has to do with marriage. Mm. And in the times when we were kind of sold off <laughs> to be married, who was going to be chosen as a wife was if you were more quiet, if you were prettier, if you were quote unquote, right, societal, if you were maybe lighter skinned, whatever it might be. And so these are very old, very old stories and stereotypes that we need to shift. And I love what you're saying, Molly. Basically, if we reject that any of us are better than any one of us, and instead of spending our time, energy, money on competing with each other, rather we spend it on creating more opportunities for all of us, we would have such a winning combination. Yeah. When I first got into health and fitness 17 years ago, all of the websites, I mean, I was on like fitness forums, like even before social media was a thing, really. Um, But like all of the websites were by men, for men, about men. You know, there were a couple of like women's fitness magazines, but there weren't any serious women's strength training, like strength and conditioning, um, like websites. And so there were a couple women who wrote for some of the like more, you know, there was, and there would be like a women's section on a men's, on a men's site, things like that. Um, and there were maybe a couple women that wrote, but obviously, but a lot of them were men who were writing for women and about women and stuff. And so I could have competed with the other women for, the spot to write for that website. But instead I went and created 
my own organization, which now we've had, gosh, over 200 women write the thousand plus articles on our website. And, you know, we, we create these certifications that have dozens of world-class experts who are part of it. And so instead of being, instead of duking it out for that, I was like, why don't I just go and create, you know, my own thing and build a bigger build a bigger table and give more yes. women an opportunity to, to have a seat. And I, I want to be careful too about this idea of comparison because comparison, we're, so, we're social creatures, right? It's normal for us to compare ourselves. Um, but it's the problem is when we compare ourselves to someone else and use the differences or the discrepancy to beat ourselves up instead of as information or data for how we can improve. Like if you were applying for a job, you need to know how much experience do, do you know, did the other applicants have? Like, you know, what's their, what, what credentials do they have? How much are they getting paid? How much are pe other people in this position getting paid so I can be paid fairly, right? You need to know that stuff. If you want to place in a particular athletic competition, even if you're like, hey, I just want to come in the top 10% in my age group or whatever, you need to know what are those numbers, right? But the problem is when we use that to beat ourselves up and kind of go down this shame and comparison spiral versus when we use them to to make us better and you know I actually have a story related to the book launch where I kind of started going down my own comparison and scarcity mindset spiral and how I pulled myself out of it that I would love to share if you're open to that. Oh, of course. I'm excited because your chapter on what you call the comparison trap is brilliant. Mm -hmm. So please share and, and let's then get into it more. Yeah. So I'll talk a little bit. I'll just kind of briefly prime everyone on scarcity mindset and the comparison trap. So scarcity mindset is this idea that I'm not good enough, thin enough, lean enough, fit enough, successful enough. I'm not a good enough parent. I'm not doing enough good in the world. I don't measure up. So that's kind of scarcity mindset is this overall overarching lack of enoughness. And the comparison trap is when we compare our life, our body, our kids, our finances, our vacations, our homes to other women, or when we compare ourselves to a past version of ourselves. So I used to be this, my body used to look like this. I, I was so much younger then, right? Or when we compare ourselves to a future version. So I'll be happier when, I'll be happier when I lose 10 pounds, when I get that promotion, when someone chooses me to be in a relationship, right? So it's this emotional quicksand where nothing is ever good enough. You can't live in the present. Um, and you're just constantly looking for the ways in which you don't measure up. And so I talk about this in the book and I give women steps for how to overcome it. But the tricky thing is, it doesn't ever completely go away. I'm getting ready to tell you a story about how it was hitting me a couple of months ago. Um, but the trick is it comes less often and you know how to actually pull yourself out of it and make it productive even. And so mm -hmm. um, a year and a half ago, as I was preparing my book proposal for Strong Women Lift Each Other Up, for folks who aren't familiar with that process, I was brand new to it. But for a nonfiction book, you write a proposal saying like what your book's going to be about and, you know, who you think it's going to reach. So your agent submits it to publishers and then publishers decide if they want to meet with you. They meet with you. They decide if they want to, you know, sign a contract with you, et cetera. So I was going through that process and my agent came back to me. He's like, okay, you know, we've got these meetings and I'm excited. And he's like, but I will tell you, there are a couple of publishing houses that didn't want to meet with you because they said someone really big just submitted a proposal a couple weeks before yours. And so her book is going to come out right before yours. And they think it's about a similar topic. And I was like, oh, mm. okay. Like, all right, well, you know, I, I've got my meetings and I'm thrilled with my publisher. And so I, I kind of forgot about it. Well, mm. my book came out March 9th, but sometime around January, I started seeing advertisements for this woman's book club and joining her book launch team. Oh, that's what it was, joining her book launch team. And I was like, oh, and her book's called Believe It. And it's about overcoming self-doubt. And I saw videos of her talking about like, bring another woman in the room with you and stuff. And I started thinking, I wonder if, and so this woman's name is Jamie Kern Lima. And she has a book called Believe It that came out about two weeks before mine. And she had a company called It Cosmetics that she sold to L'Oreal for $1.2 billion. And so she's a multi, multi, multi-millionaire. Um, 
Glennon Doyle gave her her blurb for her, you know, one of the blurbs for her book. And Tony Robbins did her live event and she was on Ellen. And so, Karen, as this is happening in February, I'm like spiraling. Shrinking and shrinking and shrinking (laughs) and panicking. And I'm listening to this. I'm like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. My whole heart is like, this is like my worst nightmare. Yes. Oh, and so I was just like, oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Like. Ellen and Glennon and Tony, like, you know, all these things. And I'm like, okay, she's... I can't live up to that. Yeah. She has so many more resources than me. She has so many more connections than I do. Oh my gosh. Like, this is just... And so, you know, it was kind of going into that, like, cold sweat. And um, and so I was like, okay. All right. Okay. Now I got to ask myself some questions. Okay. Like, I got to notice and name how I'm feeling because that's always going to be the first step. Noticing and naming. So noticing raises awareness of how you're feeling. And there's evidence to suggest that naming how you're feeling um, actually reduces the intensity of the emotion a little bit and creates some space. I was like, okay, I'm no, I'm noticing this. I'm like sweating through my clothes. I'm feeling, I'm feeling jealous. I'm feeling like I'm not good enough. I'm feeling like, you know, her book's going to be, you know, successful and mine's not and all these kinds of things. So then I start asking myself like, okay, why am I feeling this way? Well, I'm feeling this way because I think her book is going to be successful and she's going to reach a lot of women. And more successful than yours. Exactly. More successful than mine. And is that something that I want for myself? And the answer is yes. And so I kind of start walking myself through these questions. Then I ask myself, do I believe that one woman having success means there's less left for me? Mm. And the answer to that is no. Do I believe that a woman having success actually blazes a trail for other women to be successful? The answer to that is yes. Do I believe that a rising tide lifts all boats? The answer to that is yes. Mm. And do I want to be a strong woman who lifts other women up? And the answer to that is yes. So then I, then (laughs) I, I took it a step, I took it a step further. I flipped the script on myself and I said, what could be good for me yes. about her book doing really well. Well, if more women believe in themselves, because her book is all about believing in yourself, they might be more mentally prepared to want to be a strong woman who lifts other women up. If they don't believe in themselves, they might not even be in that headspace. Mm-hmm. If you know, our books, people start buying my book and her book at the same time, maybe Amazon starts recommending my book with her book. Maybe she hears about me and wants to bring me in the room with her because that's something that she's really passionate about. And so then I said, okay, I believe that every action we take in the world is a vote in favor of who we want to be and the kind of world we want to live in. So what actions am I going to take to be a strong woman who lifts Jamie up? And so I bought her book. I bought her audio book. I started following her on social media and I started commenting positively and supporting her on all of the posts about how well her book was doing. And I took myself from this like shrinking, not good enough comparison, mm-hmm. you know, what mm-hmm. was me like just the like, small energy to like, this is amazing. Like, this is like, this is who I want to be. This is the type of life that I want to live. This is how I want to show up for other women. I have no idea if anything will ever come of it. Right. But in, I am so much more in my power in this yes. state than I was when I was shrinking back and comparing myself. Molly, this is beautiful and genius. And it's like, of course, because your whole thing is lifting each other up, then and you write this whole book about it, of course, then during book launch, you're going to have this experience where your brain starts doing the opposite, right? Because we are, as my dear friend Valerie Burton says, we are living laboratories for Mm. what we teach, right? And so it comes up for you because this is an important story that we all need to hear because it's like, well, if here's Molly and she's got this publishing deal and she's got this book and she, and if it still happens to you, it gives us all permission to go, okay, then it's normal and it's okay if it happens to me. And then amazing sister, bravo, you using your own process as it's happening, right? That is walking the talk. And I love this because I often see jealousy and comparison as telling us what we really desire. Yeah, it is. Right? It's like, it it takes that moment of pause of, you know, feeling bad about yourself, maybe calling the other woman names and then going, whoa, 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 wait, okay. <laughs> Let me take a breath. And then being able to hone in. And what I loved about what you said is, 
this wasn't about whether or not the two of you have some sort of partnership and will this work for you, right? Are you going to get something out of it? This was how do you want to show up? Mm-hmm. And you want to show up as the woman who supports other women. And that's your ultimate desire. And so what a great opportunity to like shift that. Yeah. And, and you know, I think that so many of us want that, but we don't know how to do it. And so that's why, like, at the end of chapter four, which is all about the comparison trap, I actually have like a values filter. So chapter five, I walk you through how to find your values. But the, but this values filter teaches you how to use those feelings of jealousy and comparison as a compass. So you ask yourself, you walk yourself like, OK, I'm feeling this way. I'm feeling jealous of this person. Do I want what they have? And if the answer is you know, no, it's like, okay, then I can kind of create a little bit of space and let that go. The answer is, I'm not sure you can ponder on a little bit longer. If the answer is yes, then the next question is, am I willing to do what it takes to, you know, or sorry, does this align with my values? And so then you can say, okay, well, someone, for example, just got a big promotion at work, right? And you're feeling jealous because they got a fancy new title, and maybe they're making some more money. But if, you know, your top values in life are family and, you know, uh, adventure and connection, maybe doing the stuff that it takes to get that promotion or to have that fancy new title doesn't align ultimately with what you want for your life. And so if you got it, mm. you wouldn't actually be happy, right? It wouldn't do the mm-hmm. thing. So if the answer is no, then you can say, okay, that's not actually what I want for myself. If the answer is yes. Then you can say, okay, am I willing to do what it takes to, to get that? And if the answer is yes, then it's like, great. Now you have a roadmap. You can look at that person and be like, well, what did they do? How many hours did they work? What degrees did they have? How did they network? You know, and you can reverse engineer the things that they did to get to where they are and figure out which ones of those you might be able to apply to your own life. So you can actually take these feelings of jealousy and comparison and use them as a compass to point mm-hmm. you in the direction that you want to go. It's so genius. It's so genius. I love your questions. I love that you take us right to the heart, right, in in the exercises in the book and what you just did. Because what I've experienced with jealousy and with comparison is then we pile on ourselves with shame. I shouldn't be jealous of other women. I shouldn't be comparing. I, I shouldn't be comparing myself. And, you know, comparing, I've mentioned this before on the podcast, but I want to be clear, it's actually evolutionary to your brain to compare with other people. Because if you think about our early ancestors and when they were wandering people and they were living among nature and Molly's family was doing really well, they had a lot to eat, right? I could tell that they were healthy and thriving and my family wasn't. I needed to be able to look over at Molly's family and go, what's Molly doing? Oh, okay. I notice they hunt at these hours or they're eating this kind of food and notice as a learning opportunity. So your brain actually evolves to compare. It's just that now we turn it over onto kind of its worst side of then making it mean that there's something bad and wrong about us instead of using it as that compass and that learning that's actually super cool. Like one of the exercises I'll do with clients is, you know, think to yourself, who are the women that you're jealous of? Let's just be honest about it and get it out. And then... What does that tell you about what you might desire? And I remember I had a friend when I was starting as a coach, maybe it was a couple of years in, and I met another woman coach, Paula, and she was working in Paris. And I was like, why does Paula get to work in Paris? Like, that's not fair. And, you know, and then I'm like, oh, wait, back up. Oh, do I want to work in Paris? Do I want to work abroad? And the answer was yes. So I said, okay, I'm going to hold a retreat in Paris. Like, I didn't know if anyone would come. I just put it out to my newsletter list. And I filled that retreat and five women came with me to Paris and I got to be in my favorite city doing women's work that I love, drinking champagne on top of the Eiffel Tower. Like, okay, now I work in Paris too. And so there is this opportunity to shift it, which is so important. Yeah. And it's that introspection and that self-reflection and figuring out what questions to ask yourself and remembering Mm. that my friend Melissa Urban says, judgment is a mirror, not a window. 
And I think the same is true for comparison as well. Comparison is a mirror, not a window, right? When we're comparing ourselves to someone else and comparing what they, it's just like reflecting back to us like, oh, okay, this, these are the things that we want for ourselves, or this is what we're struggling with right now. And so it really just allows you to get very valuable introspection time to figure out what is it that I, what is it that I think I want? Is Mm -hmm. it what I really want? Because again, values are something that had, since I've discovered mine have just been life changing for me and making difficult decisions in business, relationships, work, life, everything. Mm. Um, Tell us more about that. Oh yeah. So values are essentially like the ingredients that you think are important for a good life. So, you know, running girls gone strong. We've got gosh, 35 or 40 people that are part of the team. Uh, We've got this giant global community. We're constantly having to make difficult decisions Um, and discovering my values several years ago really helped me make those decisions and run things through my values filter to determine if they are going to feel good to me. So um, within the book, I walk you through a values finding exercise. You ask yourself a bunch of questions about like, when am I happiest? When am I most proud? You know, when do I have feelings of flow? And um, you go through all of these different possible words. So again, connection, adventure, family, faith, fitness, health, whatever. Um, and, and you narrow them down to 25 and then you narrow it down to 10 and then you narrow it down to five and then to three. But then once you get your three values, this is where a lot of, um, values exercises stop. But in my book, I walk you through, then you, um, test them against each other. So you said, okay, if I had to make a decision based on this or this, what would it be? And then if I had to make a decision and then you rank them top three, cause sometimes they will compete with one another and you'll have to make a decision where one of them, you know, is, is wins out a little bit more. Um, and then you reality test them. So you ask yourself, like, if I made a decision according to my values that put me in the minority, would I still feel really good about it? If it made other people upset with me to make this decision that aligned with my values, would I still do it and feel steadfast in it? And man, I mean, the feeling of steadfastness that you get when you're like, yep, this is who I am. This is what I do. Like, I understand why someone doesn't like what I do, but like, that's cool, man. You know, like these are my, these are, I'm living according to my values. So my number one value is make a difference. And so in everything that I do, I'm thinking about how I can make, have the biggest impact, make the most difference. And, um, you know, so people will have opinions about what they think we should be doing at Girls Gun Strong. And I'm like, hey, I hear you. That's super valid. Um, we chose to do it this way because we think that it's going to have a bigger impact. But, you know, we really appreciate your feedback. And, you know, we'll take that into consideration. But just like, I mean, you just feel rock solid when you are radically clear on those values and can make decisions according to them. So true. So I have to tell you, I have done a similar exercise and give it also to clients and you nailed it. I was so curious about your process and about how you use it now, because when I did the a value, similar values exercise, this is when I was trying to figure out my purpose. So we're probably going back like 15 years ago and maybe even a little bit longer. And at the time I was in an MBA program because the company I worked for at the time paid for an MBA. And I'm like, all right, free MBA. I don't know what else I want to do. I just know I'm like, I'm unhappy. I want to figure out my purpose. I don't know what it is. Blah, blah. All right, you'll pay for an MBA. I'll take an MBA. Well, this was Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland. And it just so happened that they have a whole positive organizational scholarship focus that I didn't even know what that was at the time. Like now I do because I'm in positive psychology, but I didn't know then. So the first class that you need to take in your MBA program is called LEAD, Leadership Assessment and Development. Well, it's basically taking a whole bunch of exercises like this. And so that you can like figure out, do I want to go into marketing or what do I want to do? And I did this values exercise and I had to come down to the comparing. Now it was between the top 10. We were told compare them so you can start ranking them. And beauty kept coming to me. And I was like, oh my God, I'm so ashamed. Like I was choosing beauty over world peace. I was choosing beauty over family. Like what is wrong with me? My top one was courage. And I was able to identify then it's because people I really admired and who inspired me had so much courage. They had gone out on their own and doing their own business. They were following a dream, whatever that was. They would be assertive and speak their voice. And I was like, courage, courage, courage. That's number one. It won out over everything. 
But beauty kept coming up as number two. And Molly, I felt like such a horrific person. And at the time, I wasn't even someone who owned any design or anything. Like, I barely wear makeup. Like, what am I talking about beauty? But when I really allowed myself to have it and I sat with it, what I came to really sit with is my whole thing is seeing the beauty in other people. And I really believe everybody is beautiful. And that when we each see ourselves that way, the world is going to change. And I am the person who stops and smells roses. Like I literally am that. You don't want to take a walk with me. I literally am that person, right? And especially now that it's like spring, I stop and I notice a tree and how the buds are growing every day. Like I am that person. And that for me, beauty brings about my creativity. It makes me happier. I think we're all better when we're in a beautiful environment. And so... It's really that important to me. And allowing myself that truth has mattered. And I find that too with clients. If you don't know how to make decisions, like again, another reason to get Molly's book is this incredible exercise that's in here. It allows you to one, get right, as you say, get right with yourself. And then gives you a great compass of what is important for you when you make decisions. So, Molly, we only have a few minutes left. And so the first half of the book is like yourself and your own strengths and what is, you know, beautiful and powerful about you and what you want in life and your values and all of these incredible things. And then the second half is lifting each other up. And what do you say to the woman who's out there and she's like, I'm in an environment where all of the other women are so catty, my own boss, because I had this experience, my first job out of college was a female boss and... She only hired young women and she told us all that we couldn't have kids because she didn't have children. I mean, now she would probably be like fired and sued for that. But, you know, this is, this yeah. is like, you know, a long time ago. And there still are these, these catty thing, fights that you and I were talking about happened to us when we were young. This is still happening as adult women. So what is the advice for the woman out there who's, subject to this and she wants to lift women up but that's just like not what's happening yeah that is so hard especially when we've gone through our own personal transformation and we've seen how amazing it can be to live in this particular way right to like it's like finding health and fitness or finding this this philosophy of lifting women up and seeing how great life can be we want other people to do it too. It's like, no, you can do this. It can be different. Right. But the most challenging lesson that I probably relearn every day is that we cannot control other people. We can only control ourselves. And so I found a couple of powerful things that have happened in my life since I have adopted and more embodied this philosophy a lot more. Um, was one, a lot of the people who've been in my life for a really long time, have actually come along the journey with me. So like Mm. the same women that I, you know, would gossip about other people with and would me, you know, like be, you know, you know, mean girl type stuff with we've, we've grown along this kind of spectrum together where now it's like we hear gossip and it's like nails on a chalkboard. We just, we just can't even with it, you know? Um, And so they've kind of grown along with me because I have role modeled that behavior and they Mm. have seen the, the, power in that. Again, it's like any other positive behavior, right? If someone starts, uh, you know, eating better and moving their body, or if someone finds a particular, you know, religious or spiritual thing that, you know, really does it for them. And other people are like, oh, wow, there's something really special about Karen. Like I, you know, what is, what is this? Yeah. What's she doing? I'll have what she's having. (laughs) Exactly. So I found a lot of people have come along that spectrum with me. And then I've attracted a lot of women into my life who embody that already. So even if, you know, maybe my newer friends or family, So in terms of like, you know, like a work environment and things like that, it's so hard. I understand because you, you know, like you can't control other people. So I just always ask myself, like, how do I want to show up? How do Mm -hmm. I want to treat these other people regardless of how they're treating me? I had um, several years ago, a split with an old business partner and um, this person was just dragging me, just dragging me to everyone in our industry. And I just never said anything negative. And people asked me about him and I was like, Oh yeah, he's great. And this and that. And three or four years later, someone came up to me and they told me a story and they were like, Hey, you know, said this person had done something really negative to them. And they're like, everything he said about you, that was him. That was all him. You're not, that's not who you are. And I just figured like, 
you know, like who I am is going to, the, the truth is going to eventually come out, you know, and, and I just want to, again, feel good about how I show up. Like, how do I treat mm. other people? And so for me, um, that's the most, the simplest and most practical advice is that we can't change other people as much as we want to, but we can role model for them what it looks like to show up differently. I think if you're in an, like a really toxic or abusive environment, <laughs> trying to find a way to get out of that environment whenever possible is really important. Um, and depending on the situation, there are lots of different ways to do that. But when it comes to, again, friends or family or people that you want to keep in your life who are acting that way, it's about setting clear boundaries. It's about role modeling. It's about setting, setting and enforcing those clear boundaries. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. The boundaries don't matter if you don't enforce them and just saying, Hey, I'm not interested in having and talking about other women like that. Or like, Hey, you know, if you keep like, you know, commenting on my body or talking negatively about your own body, like I'm just going to have to end this conversation. Cause I'm just, that just doesn't feel good to me anymore. Um, you know, there's no judgment or whatever. It just doesn't feel good to me. And so, <clears throat> so setting and enforcing clear boundaries, role modeling what that behavior looks like and just you know continually asking yourself like like if I were being my best self how would I show up in this moment and and showing up that way so that you always again feel that that clarity and that steadfastness in who you are and how you're showing up in the world mm, 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 mm. I love that and what it shows is a way for you to lift other women up is simply asking yourself how do I want to show up in this moment I, it's right like we might think, oh, my God, do I need to, like, hire people or start, you know, a big blog or a business like Molly did and have 2,000 women write for me? It can be as simple as showing up the way you want to show up and that that is the role model. Yeah. We underestimate the power that we have to positively influence and lift up other women just being who we are. And chapter eight of the book, I share, well, there's a couple of different stories throughout, but chapter eight of the book, I share all of these women who ended up lifting women up and having these massive impact just by being themselves. And um, so one of the women started writing about being, what it was like to be a black woman in fitness. Um, another woman uh, came out as trans and had had this massive following in fitness um, prior to that. And so that was really, really powerful. And then another woman st had started a weight loss blog and over time decided that that wasn't aligned with her values. So she started sharing um, photos of herself and like, she's really into fashion. And all of these women started being like, where are you finding this plus size fashion that fits you? That's comfortable. That's affordable. So now she actually runs a social media consulting company that consults with size inclusive brands to help them, mm. to help them be more successful and create things that women in larger bodies actually want for themselves so that they can be more successful that. and then women can get access to clothing. And so, and like, they just started out just being themselves. It's like, I'm literally taking pictures of myself in clothes that I like and posting it on the internet. You know, I'm literally sharing my story of, you know, what it's like for me in health and fitness or sharing my story of who I am. And it's just like wildly inspiring and lifting up other women. Mm. You know, I'm so obviously into purpose and that's it. Your purpose ultimately comes down to number one, you being yourself, you being your true self, you being, right? And then you doing whatever comes up as your heart, because when you're doing the ideas, the whether it's posting on the internet or being and the role model and, you know, doing one thing for another woman or for a girl or, or a, a young man, whatever it might be, you are making an impact. And we have to remember that, right? I want everyone to know you don't have to take like these enormous strides where now you have to think, how am I going to like create three new positions for women? It, it begins with you showing up the way you want to show up and being that inspiration, making that impact. It's so powerful. Molly, obviously you and I could talk forever and there's so much here. And the best thing about the retreats, the best thing about, I think all of my work is the, is sisterhood, right? I mean, it's like women supporting each other. I do this exercise called the circle of love, we put one woman into the middle of the circle and then women get to love on her and tell her what they see is beautiful about her. And there's so much we could go there, you know, a, a simple lift other women up. What if once a day you compliment another woman, right? In COVID times, hasn't, we haven't seen as many women, but that too will pass. And you pass by a woman and tell her her outfit is beautiful or tell her that her skin is glowing. I mean, it can be so simple and you can do it on Zoom. Do you have like a quickie tip like that about lifting up other women? 
Oh, yeah. So chapter seven is called Eight Small But Mighty Ways You Can Lift Women Up. And so the idea is that when we start lifting women up, I wanted to give women all these ideas of ways that they could do it without time, money, resources, influence, platform, network. I didn't want women to get to the end and be like, well, that must be nice for you, Molly. You have all, you know, you have all the access to all these things, right? Which is very true. I wanted them to say, no, any person can do this at any point in time in their life. So chapter seven includes things like giving a genuine compliment, catching a woman doing something right, which is a little different than giving a genuine compliment, but just saying like, you know, I loved how you, you know, showed up for this person in that meeting. Or if you are lucky enough to be out at a restaurant, I call the manager over and say, my sir, our server has been so patient. We've had so many questions and she's just been so nice. And I appreciate her. It's endorsing another woman. It could be as small as, you know, writing a review of the book of their book on Amazon or endorsing them on LinkedIn, or it could be as big as writing a recommendation letter for a position. Um, it could be buying from a woman owned business. And it doesn't even have to be spending money that you weren't planning on spending, but just the next time you're going to make a purchase, whether it's coffee or leggings or skin cream or whatever, do a quick Google search, like woman owned leggings business, woman owned skincare, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. say, Hey, I'm going to mm -hmm. be intentional about buying from a woman owned business. So there's all Love of that. these different small, tiny things that we can do in our everyday lives to lift women up in powerful ways that don't take time, extra money, resources, influence, anything like that. Incredible. Incredible. Everyone, this book is so good. You want to make sure that you are going to get it. It's called Strong Women Lift Each Other Up. And of course, we have the link in our show notes and you want to make sure that you are doing so A for you because the exercises are so good. I'm telling you, it's like every three pages, there's two pages of exercises for you to like really go do it, right? It's like rather than sitting with, okay, but how? She outlines it beautifully. Okay, Molly, in our last couple of minutes, I love doing this thing with my guests called a purpose power play round. And that's when I ask you a couple of random questions and whatever's the first thing that comes to your mind. Let's do it. All right. When you were a little girl, what'd you want to be? Oh, I wanted to be a chef, a masseuse, or an actress. And I hate cooking. And my poor boyfriend, after five minutes, my hands get tired of rubbing him. He's like, you can lift so much weight in the gym. Why do your hands get so tired? I'm like, I don't know. Or an actress. Well, what I love to do is to like start thinking about, oh, what are the themes under there? And so like you are on a big stage, right? So maybe there was something, you're on a big stage, right? You speak, all of that. Masseuse helping people, you totally do. I mean, health, I might be yeah. making this up and it might help, right? Yeah. Like it could be a whole bunch of bullshit, but I kind of like seeing if anything yeah. was in there, right? All right. So you hate cooking now. What is something other, obviously, than your work? What do you love? Hiking. I, Ooh. and here's the funny thing is I was so indoorsy growing up that when I would walk to my walk to the car for school, I would put a plastic bag over my head. So my hair didn't smell like the outside. I'm not kidding. <laughs> and now I hike like 20, 30 miles a week. Oh my goddess. That is amazing. I love that. And of course your teenage self did that because in order to be cool and to be liked, you couldn't smell like the outdoors. Exactly. You had to smell that good. Makes, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. You had to smell whatever good means. Yeah. All right. 10 years from now, what's one juicy, fun thing you'd like to have or do or be? I would love to, speaking of hiking, I would love to pick out the top two to three trails on every continent and hike them with my partner. So not necessarily <sighs> like the hardest or the biggest, but like the most beautiful, the most breathtaking. I would love to, yeah, to pick the like two to three most, you know, desirable trails on every continent and go hike those. Ooh, so yummy. And she just did like a little shoulder lift shimmy thing. So we know that that's really turning her on. I love it. Okay, last question, Molly. What's one thing you want every woman to know? Mm. That they are good enough just as they are and that they are powerful and that them being who they are can make a difference and make the world a better place. Mm. That's like four things, but it's all wrapped into one. Year. It's all the same. We'll, we'll take it. Beautiful. Well, Molly, so good to be with you again. I just adore you and love your book and love everything you're doing. So thank you. Thank you for being on the Purpose Girl podcast, Molly. 
Thank you for having me and for asking such good questions. Like, I love your energy. I feel like I could just like jump through the computer and give you a hug. So thank you. Do it, do it, do it, do it. (laughs) Thank you for (laughs) your important work and for, yeah, I, I do not take it lightly when someone brings me into their space and, you know, shares me with their audience and their community. Cause I know when you've been doing what you've been doing for a while, you've built a lot of trust. So it means a lot to me and I appreciate it. And I'm just happy to be connected with you and and your community. So thank you, Karen. Mm, It's my honor and pleasure, sister. This is how we lift each other up. And so all of you out there, if you love this episode, of course, go get Molly's book, follow her in all the places that we have on the show notes. And to lift me up and lift up the Purpose Girl podcast, head over to Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen, leave your five-star review. It literally takes you 60 seconds. And that is how you can change both my life and the Purpose Girl podcast and women's lives all over the world. And that's what we're all about here is changing the world one woman at a time. So share this episode with every woman you know. If you're not yet in the Purpose Girls Facebook group, what are you waiting for, woman? We are almost 4,000 women strong and every day we're posting different prompts and amazing things for you to really love who you are, for you to think positively, for you to go after your dreams, get your purpose and feel totally alive and full of joy. And with that, my love, may you live purposefully. May you love yourself and may you love life. Bye for now.